Well, I've got I've got the meeting open, so people should be able to come in. I might kick off with just a little bit about myself and where I come from and why I, I, I'm so interested in this topic. Um, I'm currently a higher education consultant, but I've worked in higher education my whole career. Um, and my focus has always been educational innovations. Um, I've worked at universities in Australia and also at the University of Cambridge uh, in the UK. And now I'm working in the Netherlands for family reasons. I have um, connections to the Netherlands through my wife and enjoying it immensely. Um, many years ago, I worked on a project called La Swap, which stood for a legal and social work practice, something that seems to have a, a relationship with people who are on the call today. And um, it was an online learning platform, a very, I guess, early days web-based platform, um, which was a simulation for students uh, and was lucky enough for to win a, an Australian Financial uh, Review Internet Award um, at that time. And so I've, I've maintained an interest in how simulations can be applied to areas like social work, um, including in clinical settings in other areas um, for quite some time. And my master's thesis was about online role plays. Um, and I've developed a whole range of online role plays. So this is a subject that's quite, quite close to my heart in the sense that we'll get into some stuff about how educational innovation could be brought along by these emerging technologies. Um, but in a broader sense, this year is you know, looking like being yet another very transformative year, isn't it? Because we have, of course, the rapid evolution of things like ChatGBT and other large language models doing all kinds of amazing things. I don't know how many people have seen Sora, the video um, platform that OpenAI has been showcasing before its release. Uh, it's a little bit scary, um, but also quite amazing. Um, and all of this is signaling this, this quite strong paradigm shift, um, particularly uh, in the wake of the changes that we've all experienced through the pandemic towards an online and blended learning approach towards education. Um, so our aim today is to bring together people who have something to say about this, to deliberate on the implications of AI in particular um, and uh, allied health and social work in particular both education and practice in those areas, but with a strong focus on education. We realise that one roundtable event, one webinar, et cetera, cannot solve all the problems that we identify in this um, or all the opportunities or raise all the opportunities, but we, we realise this important work has to start somewhere. And we had a roundtable event uh, in London in January of this year, um, Mary was present for that uh, and uh, I was there in person and we got together a number of people, a number of social work people as well, by the way, um, to talk about the future of allied health in the age of AI and big data. Um, we spent quite a bit of our time in that conversation rehearsing some of the challenges, particularly things to do with ethics, um, the changes needed in clinical practice settings, and of course, in educating the next generation of um, social workers and allied health professionals with this really changing uh, and different world. This event follows up on some of the major themes that came out of that conversation. So we're not gonna do the same conversation. We wanna pick up on the themes that emerged from that previous one. And the topics that we've sent around to people to think about, are these. Firstly, conscientious technology integration. In other words, how can we proactively select and integrate technology such as AI, VR and AR, uh, and so on, to enhance the teaching and practice of social work and allied health, while ensuring that these tools serve to amplify rather than overshadow the human connection. And then we, we want to create human-centric learning environments. Um, in, other way, in other words, uh, in what ways can we utilise emerging technologies to create inclusive and ethical 
learning spaces that reflect the core values of the profession and foster empathy, understanding and real world, world readiness among students. And finally, empowerment through innovation. How can educators and institutions lead the charge in ad adopting technology that not only enhances the educational experience, but also prepares students to be adaptive, ethical and effective practitioners in a digitally evolving society? So I guess we're really picking up where we left off with a large conversation about challenges and moving towards. What can we do about it? Um, and the format will be simple. I'll just do a brief introduction of each of our panelists, uh, and then I'm going to jump in and start asking some questions, uh, and then we'll open it up for a broader discussion. So I'll firstly introduce each of you, and then I'll come back to you and ask for, for some words, uh, everyone. But, and first we have Dr. Mary Hodorowitz, um, who's an expert practitioner an educator in family and child welfare from the University of Maryland and brings a wealth of experience in integrating advanced simulations for teaching motivational interviewing techniques. We also have Professor Claire Stone, who is Director of Social Work at Lancaster University and is a registered social worker whose research focuses on competence for social work practice and workplace learning. And Claire has written uh, about you know, taking a toe into this generative AI area and thinking about what it means for social work um, practitioners and, and um, people being prepared for their profession. And last but not least, we have Michiel Hulsbergen, who's the CEO of Dialogue Trainer, which provides an AI assisted platform for students to practice difficult conversations and new conversation methods with a virtual character. Uh, this, um, none of us are virtual characters today, by the way, we're all real. Um, but uh, this platform was developed together with Utrecht University, um, where research was done into what makes scenarios effective. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you also, Merima, I feel like you should be a panellist and honorary one as well. We'll ask you to do an intro in a minute. Um, but I'm going to kick off um, with Mary, I think. Mary, we'd love to hear a little bit about your response to the topics that uh, were raised today. Um, and um, we'll just take, say, three to five minutes each to do these brief responses, if that's all right. Take it away, Mary. Sh sure, Matt. Um, there are very few things in my life that are brief, so feel free to, to cut <laughs> me off. If we were old school on the stage, you could get the cane and yank me, yank me away. Um, on here, you have a. I hope you have an automatic mute. Um, so it's so it's interesting what you um, what you shared, and Claire, you had shared just a little bit earlier about um, you know understanding and kind of grappling with and getting our brains around this for for social work education. So in thinking about using AI and thinking about using simulation and thinking about using technology in uh, specifically social work education, but more broadly um, health science, human service education. I think that there, um, like many things in social work in that, that area, there are strengths and there are struggles. And so I think if we want to be conscientious about this, we have to um, be, we have to be mindful, number one, to be collective and conscious in the creation and integration of this technology, right? So if the people who are creating the technology are not in communication with the people who need to use this technology in allied health, or the people in allied health are not in communication with the, the folks who are creating and advancing the technology, there's gonna be a gap. There's gonna be a really um, big struggle on both, on both ends to make it applicable, realistic, user friendly and really just current right uh, the other thing to be mindful of again and thinking about kind of this bridge between um users and and creators is thinking about um collaboration with access we uh, to this moment in 2024 i am still i just 
was able to get all of my foundation social work students. So I'm in a master's of social work program in Baltimore, Maryland. And just this year, we will we were able to get all of our students access. Every single student in their incoming year was able to have a simulated client experience to help prepare them for their practicum. And in some ways that makes me very joyful. And in another way, I'm very scared because what that means is it took this long for us to ensure that every client had some sort of professional interaction practice experience before we sat them down with real humans. And so I think that being mindful about this access piece is, is really um, important. And I'm looking forward to speaking with everyone and kind of getting our brains around that. And then the last piece is thinking about the recognition of capacity. So folks who are in health science and human service work, and especially social work, have very limited resources. We are always being asked to do more with less. And so how do we create these opportunities for access? How do we utilize technology to increase the competence of our social workers and to support basically better treatment for our clients, right? That's that's what we're working towards, both on an individual but an environment level. So we can impact structures, access to healthcare, um, oppressive uh, circumstances that have uh, previously kind of excluded groups of folks, you know, how can we be um, uh, conscious of creating capacity, right? So we recognize limited capacity and we recognize areas where we can create capacity. And that, so I think that technology and AI, there's a real opportunity for increasing capacity. We just have to be, again, um, mindful about how we um, how we collaborate on it. So that's that's kind of my my piece there, and I look forward to hearing other folks. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, so we will move on to Claire now, if that's all right, Claire. Yeah, that's fine. Um, a great deal of what Mary said really resonated with me in terms of probably where I started from and getting your head around it um it is my starting point so i only came um to generative ai last summer and it was at a conference and i'd always thought it was a little bit gimmicky before that it was just another thing let's have a go and a play with this and um i went to a workshop and was on the sort of ban it continuum let's just ban this it's, it's really dangerous students are using it and very quickly having engaged with some students who the majority of students are using generative AI um, were the ones who were left behind as educators. They were saying, no, this is it's like banning the calculator. We need to be um, um, we need to be trained in how to use it ethically and competently. So I moved along that continuum quite quickly and realised there was a lot of noise in universities, but very little in so the social work field, particularly in terms of generative AI, and almost nothing in terms of the workplace learning. So in England, we call it workplace learning or placements, which um, other in countries call it field education and field educators. So my particular interest is practice educators, which are field educators. And I've done a number of, of things over the years in trying to help them to be better educators, because our social work students spend an awful lot of their training out in placement being taught, supervised and assessed by these people. And they, a lot of them didn't know what generative AI is. And I'm thinking, well, if we're moving on, and we're doing these things in the classroom and within the universities, actually, they need to be using it in the workplace as well to future proof them to be to be competent users of it. So as, an, as somebody who's been in education a long time, I thought, if I'm really struggling with this, I'm sure the educators who are predominantly social workers, they're social work practitioners who do education on the side, will struggle a little bit. So that's that's the article that Matt was talking about. That's where that came from. My initial exploration into using generative AI and some suggestions about how people might use it in the workplace as a learning tool with, with students. And then I thought it's no good just proposing some things. I need to find out whether any of this is, is useful or not. So I've now engaged in some research. So what I do is I do um, a, a workshop with practice educators to show them chat GBT and Bing um, and open the, the open things. That, you know, this is what it does. These are the capabilities. And then they can volunteer to take part in an interview once they've had the opportunity to work with a student. So I'm just at that phase at the moment, rolling out more workshops 
and also hearing from them. And what I'm becoming aware of is a workshop isn't enough for everybody. Some people who have got motivation to use it, like educators who work full time. You know, I've talked about it being gimmicky. If you're given a tool, some people will just snap it up and have a go with it. And other people have to have the motivational expectancy to be able to use it competently and it's going to save them time. And that's coming through in the, the research that I'm doing with the one to one interviews is educators, whether they're in the university or out in, in placement settings have got to be introduced to it in the right way and find the purpose of it. And it still is a, a relational activity. So a lot of your questions matter about how we maintain the human in this. And I think our, um, as perhaps mentors in how we might use this, we have to think about that human relational activity of inspiring other people to use it. And then they have to use it in their own educational practices with learners in a very human way and a very relational way, which is, is very social work language anyway. So we need to mirror those principles um, and I, I, like Mary, will talk for the next three hours about drawing breath. So I'm going to pause at that point because um, I think I've given you an introduction as to I'm no expert in this. I'm just trying to work my way through and then present it back to other people in a way that they might find useful. Thanks, Matt. Wonderful. Yes, I will come back to you to use some more of that, uh, those thoughts. Uh, but I'll move on to Michiel now and ask you, Michiel, what, what your thoughts were in relation to these topics. Yeah, the, I've, I, of course, come in through a somewhat different angle. Uh, I am a trained psychologist, uh, but uh, basically I've been working my entire career in training and uh, and I've done some actual work, uh, also social work, also in uh, some challenging areas in the Netherlands. Uh, but but mostly always I've been involved in training. Uh, I'm also not a computer scientist and we have computer scientists here in the organization, but what What's hugely beneficial about my position, I work both in the field of uh, training people and in developing software uh, in these trainings. So it's it's kind of like the sort of data which is now being processed in uh, in our uh, huge uh, computational systems, uh, AI, yeah, ChatGPT and others. Um, the, the kind of information that goes in there is the kind of information that I've been working with now for 10 years uh, as part of uh, digitizing training. And, and, and the, 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 one of the interesting uh, things I, I notice indeed is the, the extent to which things are perceived as a threat uh, and the, uh, the sense on the other hand that people don't think things are a threat, but they're a solution to everything. And of course, like many things in life, nothing is just a threat or the solution to anything everything it's it's somewhere in between and yesterday had a, 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 a nice little anecdote uh, somebody had written uh, a, a large linkedin post about dialer trainer uh, and using ai to train uh, people in things ai can't solve and the first response to that linkedin post was uh, that doesn't sound too uh, sensible uh, using ai to train uh, people in things ai can't solve i was like that's not even a logical response I mean, why would you not use AI to train people in things AI can't do? That, uh, but it, it sort of speaks to me to uh, the intuitive response of many people to feel threatened by, uh, by things. And of course, there are threatening aspects about AI. Uh, uh, I'll, 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 I'll share my ideas about that a little bit. So the, the two basic threats of uh, the kind of uh, 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 societal development we're in is on the one hand, if, if computational systems solve many of our challenges, then who's in charge of these systems? And of course, over the past decades, we've seen the world change towards uh, some people, uh, the Elon Musk's of the world, having just an infinite amount of resources and other people uh, struggling to get by. And that, that's a threat. And I think also uh, a, a threat is that anybody who's, who wants something can use AI to improve their impact, right? Uh, so, so if I want something that's that's not very positive, I can also uh, find resources in AI to move my agenda forward there. Then, then about the aspect of AI replacing some of the jobs we're doing, I find it an especially interesting one. Because what AI is mostly about pattern recognition, of course, about uh, uh, making computations to relate uh, 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 data points and just say, uh, this, this is where things, uh, this, this likely makes sense. This could be what's happening here. Just make assessments. And, and, and I relate that, I like to relate that to uh, 
And when we look at the Gallup reports, for instance, about people and being motivated to do their job well worldwide, we all know this percentage of just about 86% of the people not really being motivated uh, completely to do their job well. And I assume, and I may be wrong, that that is because large parts of our jobs are repetitive. Usually the repetitive parts of our jobs are not the parts that excite us. Where, where this brings us that uh, I think also in social work, and we don't know exactly how, but we know that it, it, it can, uh, 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 there's quite a, a lot of aspects of social work that can be helped by AI, by pattern recognition, by helping people out solving uh, challenges. Uh, e even if it's only navigating sort of uh, governmental uh, trajectories, uh, we, we can help here. Um, and, and then there are opportunities for professionals, uh, social work professionals, to, to really, at the points where they are needed, they, where only they can help, they can focus on those points. So that means that if you look at uh, social workers as a resource, you, get, you can reach a lot more with these resources if you solve repetitive challenges via AI. That is a very positive thing, potentially. Then we, when we come to uh, training these, uh, these social workers, uh, of course, if we can indeed manage to get the social workers to do the things that they, uh, where they make the difference, AI uh, provides huge opportunities to advance uh, training and to advance performance support to make sure they're more effective at what they're doing. And then finally, to share a final positive note, it is my true belief that if you put people in a position where they uh, are empowered, that most of the time they'll, uh, they'll promote agendas that are quite social. So when it comes to the threat of people being able to do things you don't want them to do via using AI, it's, 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 it's quite, uh, it makes a lot of sense that most, by far most people will use their new empowerment to good. And so that's, that's, that will be my starting point of this discussion. There's a lot of opportunities to do to, to good here, including educate people and position people strongly. Brilliant. So um, really positive uh, kickoff to the discussion. I'm going to come back to each of you, but I want to go back to Claire firstly, because as we, you said, you've written a bit about um, generative AI and you've begun this study, which is really um, important at this moment, it seems to me. Um, and I wondered if you could just put your um, social worker hat on and th and think through with, with, with us about the so what from from in, ter in terms of the future of um, social work practice learning, what might it look like? What could we get to if we do uh, do as Mikhail was just saying? You know, empower people to be able to spend time on the things that they ought to be spending time on. Can you help us to think that through? I did an interview actually a few days ago with a social worker who was started off by saying she was a technophobe and she couldn't actually even use the remote control on a television. She got three different televisions in the house, all with different style remote controls. And she said she can't even now work out in one of the rooms how to put the television on. Um, which I thought was really interesting. And then we started to, and she was laughing about it and needed a lot of encouragement to use it. And then she started to talk about when she first came into social work, she used to handwrite her notes and then give them to somebody else to type up. And then she started to use a dictaphone. And now we use laptops. And what she was saying was, I thought it was a bit odd at first, but actually it saves me a lot of time. And that's where we got to in our conversation. With, and I was thinking about motivational expectancy theory, that if you th have an expectation that this is going to be a good thing, you're more likely to embrace it. So, you know, in, in my social work career, we used to have pools of people who used to be typists and I would handwrite my notes. Now um, it's much easier. We can go in. We don't even re need to make that many notes anymore. We used to do big case recordings of I went today at 12 o'clock and I saw this. And I, now we fill preset question, you know, question. There's problems with those. Um, people don't fit into boxes, but you know where I'm going with this, that we actually have software and systems that save us a lot of time. So I, I can't imagine what social work is going to be like in another 10, 15 years. But I think the profession would embrace things if they thought it would save us time administratively 
and was benefit to the service user at the end of the day. Most people um, that I've met in my long career in social work and social work education, and even the new people who come and apply to be social workers, why? what brings you to social work? What do you want to do in social work? I want to work with people, they say. Everybody wants to work with people. Everybody wants to make a positive change for individuals, families and communities. And if, we, if they see that we can use any sort of tools, software, equipment, generative AI, whatever it is, for the greater good, I think it will be embraced. It couldn't be a better segue to asking Mary a little bit more about what she's been doing with motivational interviewing to use some of these technologies to enable people to practice the skills um, that they need to work with other people. Um, so Mary, could you just Give us a little bit more of a deep dive on what you've been working on for the last little while and how how that has um, helped in in the teaching of your profession. Sure, uh, happy to share a deep dive and and also um, would love to tie that into to building off of the thoughtful insights and stories that Claire shared. Um, so I have been working for several years on using um, simulation, online simulation to teach motivational interviewing to a variety of, um, let's say a continuum of skill, skilled social workers, meaning folks, uh, students who are very, very fresh, have never interacted with a client in their life, to seasoned uh, social work practitioners who have been um, in the field longer than I have been alive and are, are you know, struggling with the remote on their TV, um, many of them. And so we have um, gone through a process to really think about how adult skill acquisition and where does simulation best fit? And again, how can we increase um, uh, ease of access to it and make it an enjoyable experience for folks? Um, Claire, you had mentioned motivational expectations. Uh, expectancy. If folks think it'll be helpful, if they think it'll be a good experience, they're more likely to to uh, go into it and kind of um, more receptive to kind of to uptake. Um, and and Claire, one thing that you or a few things that you said that kind of struck with me that we um, you know like electronic client case notes they now they're really helpful and they save time and we have these processes and symptoms uh, systems. So when I first started training in in using dialogue trainer this was pre-covid and when i first started training using simulation all pre-covid and our continuing education credits in social work we had two different kinds category one which was a live you know interactive synchronous stuff which you as a professional social worker need and we had these category two which were described um described as self-paced and in the united states as a social worker you are required to get 40 hours of continuing education well in the united states online training was not considered category one not at all until after the pandemic basically they were like oh well we started letting there be online training be good for category ones and so um you know we're gonna work it's okay this worked we're gonna let it happen and now people love to do trainings from their houses or trainings from their agencies because it is so efficient and we have found that it can be effective so that's kind of one example that um you know, the global context, a positive impact it had. But did, should it really have taken a global pandemic for social workers to be able to receive category one credits for an online training? Probably not. And so I'll give another example of what we're struggling with now. So I would like to be able to train folks to use um, AI online simulation in social work because it um, we have just implemented our field placement, our work-based placement um, uh, students a, a simulation to kind of help prepare them when they first go into their workplace learning environments. And so there's a lot of folks now through having experienced this simulation, this initial interaction, who are interested in creating their own simulations to help um, teach and test, right? Because they can be used for assessment and they can also be used for teaching and training. Well, again, what I learned was continuing education credits are not allowed to be assigned for teaching of a software or a technology it has to be like content or practice oriented so here what you're doing is you are burdening already overburdened people that they have to find some sort of capacity in their day in their already over full 
um, jobs to then learn about this. And so one thing um, that struck with me, Claire, when we think about motivational ex expectancy, you know, number one, we, yes, we have to really kind of approach this in a way that we can show folks how it can be beneficial, fun, and and uh, help their jobs be easy. And then the other thing is we need to find a way to make it less arduous, less troublesome, less annoying. Let's be real. Like nobody has time for extra stuff. So if you can't even get continuing education credits for learning how to use AI or simulation software or other technologies, people are going to be resistant to it because, you know, nobody wants to do extra work at the end of the day because we're already doing extra on extra on extra. Um, and so I think that as we think about AI and technology and the, and the populations we want to implement with, we also have to think about the policies, procedures, and bureaucracy. And I think that that's one struggle that we always have is that the technology is moving faster than policies, procedures, and decision making in clunky organizations like academic universities or governments have. And so I think we really need to find a way to kind of streamline decision making, processing, innovation, so that we can do things like have a continuing education seminar where folks can, um, you know, can come and learn things that are very um, applicable to what they're doing, but they can also receive credit for that in a way that's um, essential to their ongoing workplace learning. Um, so I'll pause, I'll pause and step off my soapbox there and curious to hear other folks thoughts on this. Yeah, I wasn't aware of those issues, and um, and uh, it's it's really interesting to hear about uh, uh, those kind of challenges. But also, I'm I'm curious about uh, motivational expectancy because that seems to be likely to play a big role for people in in a broad range of areas. I know my kids need a conversation about that about f different foods that you haven't tried will taste better if you uh, have a positive attitude. So smile. Um, so I want to come back to Mikhail though, and just come back to some of the points that you were making um, about um, the opportunities presented by emerging technologies. Uh, of course, we're focused today on in, hoping, hopefully improving the conversation more broadly so that we don't fall into the deterministic angle on technology. This thing's happening to us, which we hear all the time in popular media. This is just happening and you better pe be prepared to change our mindset towards um we are in yeah. control so can i get you to talk a little bit about that aspect that if we use our imagination we can start to do things in a yeah. in a proactive way yeah 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 yes and, and i'll i'll relate that to something that's claire and uh, mary indeed uh, also stressed and uh uh, and, and it's not about generative AI, but I, I think there, there's an opportunity for a quick win that might just win the masses. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, I, I know, at, at least from the uh, healthcare uh, field, that the, 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 uh, the average healthcare worker feels they, they are working on reporting about 30% of their time. And it's actually research shows it's more between 15 and 20%. It's still significant, but they feel it as 30%. And, and, and one of the things AI can do here, for instance, is make sure that uh, instead of people bending over a computer to try to type something that's uh, usually not very objective still, uh, <laughs> you can just dictate uh, some, something to a program that then uh, transfers that into uh, uh, analyzable data for your colleague. So uh, 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 not too large texts, uh, very factual, uh, uh, something that, that elicits real, uh, real insights about a patient or a client. And, and that could be a quick win. And I think it would be wise to focus on a solution like that as well, uh, as, as quickly as possible to really create some space for, for, for people to also advance themselves. There's, there's another thing that I've learned from working in, uh, we did a lot of work in the Dutch prison system as well. And one of the things I'm kind of an advocate about is that uh, conversation expertise usually exists within organizations. So when we're training professionals, of course, when you're training something as advanced as motivational interviewing, uh, Mary, I think you sh some, uh, once shared with me that about 30% of people get it quite quickly, 30% of people qu get it with a lot of training, 30% of people uh, are not likely to, to ever really get it. I've, if uh, the, for, for most conversations, also in social work, a lot of skills exist uh, with people that have been learning to communicate from when they were about uh, three days old. 
Hey, so there's, there's a lot of knowledge there and effective conversations. It's not just about learning new skills. It's also about being put in a position and a role that you can actually uh, be effective from. And what, what I've started developing within the uh, prison system with Dialogue Trainer then is uh, a sort of conversation model about what kind of conversations people have with each other and, and look for solutions that explain why people are having different conversations than we want them to. So, for instance, uh, if I, if I uh, work in uh, child welfare and I have a, a child who's just being obnoxious, uh, this child is just a client uh, who needs help until I, my workload is too high. Because when my workload becomes too high, I'm going to hope the kid uh, changes a little bit faster. And that's, of course, the, the, the incredible patience that social workers might uh, show to really navigate these sort of very challenging situations. If I have to do this, 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 and this, and to be able to do this well, I have to park everything else that I'm doing. So I think the, the notion of creating space for people is an essential thing. But the other thing is the notion that the way people do their work uh, is usually not, not stupid. It's often also not ill-informed. It's also, it's often just performing under a lot of pressure. And I think we prove this uh, with the sort of analysis that we can now make about how people communicate. So for instance, we can, we can prove with simulations that if, uh, and I think uh, a good example was uh, a bad news conversation. Uh, it, it's not about social work, this example, but it's a good example. We, we, we had people play uh, bad news conversation with three different case introductions. And for the rest, of the, the scenario was the same. The introduction was either, uh, you're going to fire somebody uh, uh, you can't prove it but you suspect him to have stolen the second case is uh, you're going to fire somebody uh, well you you don't really feel like doing it but the person could have done more themselves to position themselves to organize their own future and the third is uh, you're going to have a bad news conversation uh, you're not looking forward to it uh, but at least you are well prepared and one of these three groups has a perfect bad news conversation, which we know to be very difficult. But the funniest thing is when we ask people afterwards, why did the conversation go well with you? Or why did the conversation not go well with you? The people with whom it didn't go well say, well, I don't really know. Yeah, well, I don't know. Yeah, well, I mean, seriously, he shouldn't have stolen. And the people where the conversation goes well says, yeah, well, I'm not. Yeah, I think it's just because I was well prepared. This is literally a sentence in their introduction. So, so, so what I'd like to bring into the discussion here is that by analyzing why people communicate the way they communicate, we can really get much more serious about what people need to do their jobs well. And one of the, one of the things they need is resources and time. And another thing they need is just the proper support. And they need uh, the right funding. And they need to uh, know that challenges are being solved. And this is one of the things that I know our societies are struggling with a lot. But this now becomes factual, I think. And that's promising. Really interesting. Um, Marima, I want to draw you into this conversation. So I'm just giving you the warning. I'm going to ask you to comment on something. Because uh, I, a long time ago, I read a PhD thesis by a guy called Chris Pierce. Or I skimmed it. You don't ever read it all the way through unless you're marking one, right? Um, but it was really, really interesting because that work was about the changing nature of a relationship between a, a GP, a general pr practitioner, a doctor, house arts here in the Netherlands, and their patient because of the introduction of PCs into the into the um, surgery, into the office in which a, a doctor works. Um, how prepared are we for all this, Marima? As a practitioner, as someone who's thinking about what's it going to be like, um, how prepared are we and, and what does it mean to professionals um, thinking about all these things at the moment? I don't know if you can hear me, Marima, but we can't hear you at the moment. The microphone's turned off. Yeah, now it's on. Yeah. Yes, can you hear me? 
Yes, very well. Yes, uh, thank you very much for this discussion. Indeed, it's made me think uh, a lot about all the different aspects. Uh, so I work for the doctoral school at the University of Luxembourg, and we have four different doctoral programs, one in education, psychology, humanities, and social sciences. And so what uh, we are we are thinking about now is like this ai it's, it's just coming so so quickly and you you clara you mentioned motivation so i would say like motivation for um, first of all for the for the students for example how how can it come for the students to learn about how to properly use ai and i think since the beginning ai was launched where a lot of a lot of people were had this image uh, you know of uh, ai being a something dystopian as being something that will replace human contact that will replace jobs uh, people and so on and i think already there from the beginning like when chatgpt was launched there were new new papers article which were published uh, for example also in the united states who were stating that uh, who were describing basically chatgpt as something dangerous and then uh, a few months afterwards uh, it was opposite it was really the opposite and uh, yeah this is really the motivation for example like since the beginning people were kind of scared of ai and that's why now we, we have actually to train them, even the students, the professionals, to, to train them again what AI can bring to them, something positive, because really to erase, kind of to remove this image which they already had in mind previously. And um, also to give them the motivation to learn new skills. And uh, for example, it is not always easy. Sometimes you have people who, who don't like digital tools, who are not used to them, and uh, who don't even want to learn about that because uh, they already have this negative image of that. And also, Mary, you mentioned uh, something important, which is really the policy and the procedures. And uh, about that, what can also be really useful is uh, the ethics. Ethics, for example, how to remain ethical with with when you have, for example, a machine, how to remain ethical with it, and how to also maintain an ethical human contact with others when this can also be done by by the machine who can train you basically something about the ethics but then how how can you know that it's ethical what the machine says that's also uh, an aspect which um, has to be considered and uh, so the education of professionals yes that's also something which comes also under the motivation and uh, this could, should also be part I would say of some policies actually to educate the professional but here another challenge is because I know at the the European institutions level, they are still working on uh, establishing a clear policy because AI is constantly developing and they always have to keep up with it. So yeah, these are, these are really the challenges which have to be talked about, but uh, who knows, maybe in the future AI will write a policy for itself, but then uh, how can we know like uh, that? <laughs> so uh, human intervention is still necessary because if even if AI writes it, how can we know in terms of law, in terms of everything, that it's still correct what uh, it uh, writes. Indeed. Thank you Thank very much. Thank you very much. much. That's great. Um, and I'm glad you brought up the, the question of ethics, which came up at the last, at the round table as well. We had topics like how much control do we turn over to machines in clinical settings, which you sort of referred to really. Um, will Dr. GPT slash Dr. Google put clinicians out of work? We've rehearsed that one again today a bit. And then who's accountable when things go wrong? You know, I can't sue uh, the chatbot, um, guys. This is a problem. So um, what, what, what do we need to do about it? And one of the things that came up was something that's a bit like what Mary raised, which was involving the... Uh, Hi, Stefan. Involving the um, the users themselves, the, the practitioners, the students themselves in, in uh, the conversation. And I would love to just put that question to Claire, since you weren't part of that conversation, Claire. What do you think in terms of how can we pick up the threads of the ethics around particularly clinical settings in social work? and start to pull them apart to understand what we need to do in particular to, to maintain control? I think we have to be really 
um, critical thinkers through the whole process and keep talking about it. And I talk to students, um, you wouldn't rely on Wikipedia, for example, to give you all of the knowledge and rely on that. So think about, so I'm thinking about generative AI and the large language models. Don't trust what it says, you know, use that as a starting point and don't, yeah, you don't, you don't rely on everything Wikipedia says, but it might be a good place to go and start and get some ideas and, and unblock that writer's block. And don't be afraid to use it. Don't be afraid to have a go with it. But you wouldn't um, copy the whole of um, a book chapter and produce that as an essay. So why do we assume students are going to automatically download lots of things and break ethical codes of just reproducing everything they've downloaded from ChatGPT? Because there's already articles on things already and they don't do that. So some students cheat, but they've always cheated. They've gone to essay mills before or got granny to write an assignment for them. Some people will always cheat. So I think it's about a conversation about what is ethical use. If you use it, reference it. Don't rely on it, but be really cautious, um, particularly I talk about it in, in workplace settings, is be careful what you upload. So if you wanted to upload it to refine it, there shouldn't be anything there that would identify you as a social worker, other professionals, or particularly the users as our social work services. So I think we just have to be really careful and become much more AI literate and have these conversations about what does this actually mean? And, and embrace that I mean, we know it's flawed. We know it might um, replicate um, sexism or ageism. We, we've no, there's nobody um, looking at what it's downloading and, and packaging it up nicely for the end user. We just get that raw text, which might replicate some discrimination. But let's embrace that with our social work learners. Let them download something and then we can say, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with the language? What's wrong with the concepts? How should we rephrase that particular paragraph to make it much more aligned with our social work values? So I think we can embrace some of the flaws with it at the moment and use that as a learning tool. Yeah, that's a really also a positive thought. Yeah, um, I often quote uh, Howard Reingold, uh, who um, uses the term bullcrap detection to use the slightly cleaned up version um, as the skill that is important for young learners. But also in a disciplinary context, bullcrap means something different. It's It's more nuanced and more specific uh, to to what you need to be looking for. And uh, I hear what you're saying as a call towards better education for, for skills that are critical thinking, problem solving. And we've heard Michiel talk about conversational skills and, and Mary also in the context of, of um, motivational interviewing. We've, and and Marima as well, actually. <laughs> so everybody um, who was on the call has mentioned uh, that as a great need. So if we take one really big do dot point out of this, that that is that is a key thing. Stefan, thank you for joining us. I am actually in the process of wrapping up. I'm so sorry. Um, so, but the good news is that this whole conversation has been recorded for your enjoyment later. Um, I'd like to, while I have you, uh, just thank you all for being involved today. I know quite a number of people didn't make it. I, I am sure that they will love watching this um, and uh, may like to contact people afterwards to ask questions. Uh, so I'll facilitate that by providing the recording. What I do also think we um, talked about at the beginning is there is a lot to talk about here. We may also need to engage a wider audience. So we'll look for ways to do that, picking up on these topics from today finding um, new places and spaces to talk in about this really important topic. Uh, and with that, I'll wrap it up. Thank you so much for joining and we will be in touch. Thanks for hosting, Matt. Thanks. Nice to meet you all. Apologies you for much. making it very late, Matt. No problem, Stefan. We'll catch up. <laughs> sure Thank we you will. very much. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.